Hello and welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to give you an update to my latest tower project. Welcome back. Thanks for being here. My name is Scott and if you've been following my channel for a little while then you know that I have experimented with a few different tower setups. I even ran with a setup on a trailer for a little bit. Uh, check out a video here on why I no longer do that. And I have another video that talks about why I have needed to make some changes, namely damage to my roof rack. Uh, I'll click here for that one as well. I'm going to try to talk about briefly the changes that I've done to the tower. And so what I have going on here is I changed the tower itself to a real Roan setup. So I've got a Roan base and then a Roan cap. So there is no Roan tower middle section or anything like that. And that provides me with a really ideal height of 22 inches. That's two inches taller than what I had previously. And then I cut this mass down by about 18 inches. And some of that is to account for the six inches here of additional height on the rotator. And some of that is because I wanted to shorten everything. And so the combination shortens the whole setup by 12 inches. I do still have people are noticing, you might notice that I still have a big gap at the bottom. And that's because I, I will still put a fourth Yagi on there. And so what'll happen is I'll put a 222 here where my 432 is currently sitting, and then I will lower the 432 down to the bottom, space everything out. So then I will have four Yagis. That is the ultimate setup. Now you might notice that I no longer have the six meter loop on the car, and that's because bringing everything down, uh, ultimately by one foot, presents a collision hazard with my six meter loop because it's up higher. And so now all I have is two meters, 432, and 222. You'll also notice that I do not have the ATAS mounted up at the front, nor my 223 mounted in the back. I don't think I've shared the 223 with you yet, but what I have, what happens is those antennas are tall enough to where they too will collide with the Yagi. So when you see the ATAS mounted with a Yagi, say for example at the Hankation, that's an exhibition setup. But in reality, on the road and in contests, I don't mount tall antennas with my Yagi. Now moving the antennas off the right hand side of the rack, I, I didn't just remove them, I have relocated them. And so I have a separate video on that, but briefly what I've done is this is a 52 megahertz antenna and it is taking the function of the ATAS. And so I can either put 52 megahertz here for contest or I can do 10 meters I can even tune to CB if I wanted to, but I, I typically don't. And then over on the passenger side is where I have relocated the 223 antenna to. Actually, this is a tri-band antenna and it is wonderful. It'll tune up on all three of the bands perfectly with the way everything is bonded to the hood. Again, check out that video if you're interested. Now, some interesting things about the rack is Kind of for now, ignore these two unistruts here. This is just for the loop module. Basically, the tower is mounted to two unistrut bars. So these are supporting the weight of the tower. And then this third one here acts as a hinge. So you can see my hinge there. And so this whole thing tilts when necessary. Everything is held in place by some M10T slot bolts. And so rather than using the snap around rings that used to be on here, I actually have the bolts fixed in using T bolts. And so those are held there. And so when I want to tilt the tower, I remove the nuts from these two unistrut bars right here and here. I leave them mounted on this one and then the whole tower just tilts over and then I'm able to do maintenance on it, access the top. But when I tip the tower, I'm able to put, I'll lean it right here on this padded rest. That way it doesn't fall onto the paint if anything weird happens. And so uh, it's been very sturdy right here. The rotator control cable comes out of the rotator motor there. And then it's actually fastened to this unistrut here slips in through the door and then onto my desk in the car. 
Hey, Future Scott here. I have a couple of things I want to insert here that I forgot to record yesterday. First, the guys. The guys are gone. They were there to make me feel better, but uh, they're not really doing that much. Even in the videos, I said that they were there more for retention than stability. The idea being that if I hit a big turkey vulture or a tree limb and something broke loose, I would be able to drag it down the road for just a little tiny bit, quick, just long enough to get to the side of the road and keep it from going through somebody's windshield. <laughs> um, realistically, this tower, it transmits enough noise into the car to where I can hear everything. And it's, it's really nothing most of the time. But for example, when I go down my driveway and I go over the uneven portions of it, there is about one millimeter of thrust bearing slop and I can hear that. So if I can hear that, then I'm very confident that if something breaks, I'm gonna know it immediately and then stop the car. So I'm not too worried about retention now. Stability, in order for the stability to have an effect, I would have to tension the lines so much that it would damage the roof. And I'm clearly not going to do that. So they were no good for stability, I don't think. And mm, the retention idea, it only made me feel better. So the guys are gone. Next, I am frequently asked whether I drive with all this stuff on the car. And of course the answer is yes. How do you think I got to the location where I'm shooting this video? <laughs> uh, I have had this on the car for about 30 days and have driven maybe 3,000 miles with that, including a trip all the way down to Orlando, Florida and back. But I do not normally have this stuff on the car. In fact, it's coming off either today or tomorrow. I have everything on the car for testing, exhibition, and lately photography and videography. Now that all that's done, I have one small exhibition that I'm gonna do today to a, a, a local gathering and once that's done, I don't have a, a need or desire to have the Yagis on the car, so I will take them down until the next exhibition or contest, which is RARS Fest, April 6th, Raleigh, North Carolina. I don't know if I am taking the Yagis with me for that or not, because I'm leaving from Raleigh and then going to Texas. And I'm not sure if I want to drive all the way to Texas with this stuff up there, but I might or I have a compact setup that I might put on the car and take that to Raleigh instead. I'm still thinking about it. Regardless, I don't combine all of this stuff because I, I choose to outfit my car for the mission at hand. For example, if I'm doing a VHF contest, I don't have HF antennas on the car. As I've already said, I think the ATAS collides with the Yagi's the Scorpion looks like it would, but it doesn't. The angle that I'm shooting the video at, it looks like it'll collide, but it doesn't. It's not even close, but it's just not necessary. So I don't have HF antennas on the car during a VHF contest. Likewise, or perhaps opposite of that, if I'm doing something HF related, parks on the air, or maybe a state QSO party, I don't have the Yagis on the car for an HF mission because well, they're not necessary, but they also detune the Scorpion. They collide with the ATAS, so they're not going to be up there. I don't even have the VHF loops on the car during an HF mission. My typical running setup is the verticals, not, not the hood mounts. Those are only up during VHF contests. So I have the verticals on the roof, and on the weekends, I sometimes will install the loops, and those go on the driver's side of the car. That's a weekend setup. And sometimes I drive all week like that if I was maybe a little too lazy to take them down, maybe rain or whatever. But that's how the car usually looks. The Scorpion goes up when I feel like it. It's convenient enough where I can put it on and off easily. But ordinarily, the car just has the verticals. So there you go. That's my explanation for the daily setup versus do I drive with all this stuff on the car? The bands that I'm covering right now, six meter, two meter, 432 megahertz. That's on the Yagi's. And then on the loops, I have two meter, 432 and 222. 
Now, some have asked a question, why loops and Yogi's? Yogi's get the job done. The problem that I've kind of noticed quite accidentally with Yogi's is if I'm driving down the road and I get a call from somebody who's behind me, I won't hear it at all. Of course, I don't know that because I can't hear it. So when I'm traveling and I'm listening on the loops, I will hear those calls. And so what I will do, what I have here is, here's my pass-through for the cables. I'm going to make a video on the pass-through here. But basically, the cables are separated into bundles of four. So the top ones are for the loops, the bottom ones are for the Yogi's. And I have a switch inside that allows me to switch immediately between loops and Yogi's. So while I'm driving down the road, I will be set up on the loops. If I get a call and I hear it, I will then call back to them, flip to the Yogi's, and if the signal goes away, then I know that the Yogi's are pointed the wrong way and that I need to turn them around. But there's another argument that if I can hear them on the loops and work them on the loops, then why do I need to switch to the Yogi's in the first place? So that's another argument. But I suppose if I find them on one band on the loops, get them dialed in on the Yogi's, then I can then switch them to the more focused bands. Because 432 requires a lot of focus to get zeroed in on a station. And so that's, for now, I'm experimenting with both loops and Yogi's, and I'm gonna stick with that. Should I decide to go hog wild and introduce more than just the Rover Limited or low four of VHF contest bands? Let's say that I get into some of the higher bands, then I can remove the loops altogether. And then I have eight ports available to me so that I can add in 902, 1296, and the other bands that I can't think of right now, uh, 3.4 gig, I think, and 5.7 gig. That would be a little overkill for me, but hey, overkill is what I do. Again, I will do a separate video on this pass-through. It really deserves its own space, and I just haven't taken the time. I have written an article about it, though. Check the video description for a link to an article that I've written about this pass-through. The routing for the coax, I have a pretty decent slack in it. I'd like to have a little bit more, and I do have more coax at home, so I will, I'd like to make this about a foot longer, and I can do that. It'll give me just a little bit more slack on the rotator up here, but right now the rotator can rotate. It's full, I think it can go 220 degrees before it hits, you know, it stops in either direction, and there's enough slack right there to do that. Once I get the 432 or the 222 up there and move everything down, I'm going to need more slack. So I will work on that later, and then I will reorganize this. Let me know if I've missed anything. If you've got any questions, I'm always happy to answer questions. Post below, and I guess I'll start working on this pass-through video. Until next time, thanks for being here. See you later.